Hello everyone. Boy, this camera really whites things out. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that when I'm inside it, it'll be better. I'm, I've been watching other people's videos and they're kind of dark. Hey, did you see, did you see this cat right here? It's uh, looking ahead for a life outside the booth. Okay, well, cool. Okay, I recommend you watch that. And uh, anyway, well, let's talk about what we're going to do here. This is what we're going to do here. After a lot of time, I have decided that I'm going to wire some of my cars that aren't wired this way, this way. Uh, this is uh, the practical... A Spitfire, it doesn't matter what it is, an old car with it can be a Volkswagen, a Rolls Royce, anything that has contact breaker points, uh, Mopar, uh, GM, whatever, and ballast resistor wire or ballast resistor coil, whatever it is. This is the, the, the schematic that you'll run into, uh, and we're talking about the, that's the ballast resistor, that's the coil, that's the distributor, that's the solenoid, and uh, but. They don't really tell you what you really need to know. They'll, they'll, if you know all the ins and outs of, of how things work, then it makes it a little bit more logical. And you don't end up just connecting the dots. You don't end up like Pee Wee connecting the dots, okay? You, you, want, you want to know more than that. And uh, this is just another version of the same thing. And... Uh, now some of these, sometimes you'll have a 12 volt battery with a six volt coil, but that, you know, it just depends. The issue here was cold starting and burning your points out. So how do you get enough juice to your coil to crank your car and get, and get the extra oomph you need to, uh, to start it and then keep, and then knock it down uh, knock the voltage down to keep it from burning your points. I saw Uncle Tony's garage where he had some points that had been welded. Now, I doubt seriously he did anything wrong because he's good. If you've never seen Uncle Tony, and it's all I can do to stay in looking at Mopar stuff, but uh, you know he's he's a good mechanic, and this that's kind of what this is. It doesn't matter what it is if if you've got this kind of system. Now. And I'll show you this, and then I'll talk about some of the values. And this is the way to do this thing. So you got your, your battery, and we're going to assume that you're negative earth. 12-volt battery, 6-volt, whatever it is, you know, you, you, you get the right parts for whatever it is you're doing. Not too many 6-volt systems anymore. Not too many positive earth systems anymore. And I have cars that were built positive earth, and I convert them so I can run an alternator. So, you know, that's a whole different thing. So you got your key switch. So you, these are the positions that, that you have, and one of them is a possibility. Uh, your lawnmower, whatever. You got the off position, you got the run position, you got the start position, and you may have accessory. Uh, it just depends on what you're doing. So that'll be pretty much, now you, you can put a fuse in there if you feel like it. You don't generally see fuses. On, on this part of the system, but it, it can happen. Uh, circuit breaker or something, whatever. But anyway, you're going from positive battery post to the key switch, the ignition switch. So we all know when you turn the key, you go past the run position and into the start position, which goes down to either your solenoid or your starter right here. And out of there, uh, one way or another, uh, sometimes you have a post and there are other ways which I probably am not going to go into here uh, to do this there's a real easy way and I'll let you all sort that out yourselves because uh, it, it, it can it can be done but you're going to hope especially if you got a new uh, one of those gear reduction starters which a lot of us have now because the old starters just are so heavy and you can't get, I'm trying to get parts for the Austin Healy starter now, some bushings, and they're on back order in England. So, you know, I'm just going to have to deal with that when I get there. I will recommend this to you too. I don't care what you drive. But in my case, I find that uh, I'll look at four different suppliers 
and sometimes they'll have something in stock from a different supplier. Let's let's just say a spark plug, and then some will not have a spark plug, and the other one will have it, and so it doesn't. I'm just substituting. If, if what I'm what I'm really talking about here is more complicated things, but there's one company that had a gear reduction starter for the Austin Healy. And the other company didn't even mention it. So you got you really got to shop for old cars anymore. Okay, so you see the coil up here. The coil's right here. You see the ballast resistor here. Um, hard for me to get used to framing this thing. I'll, I'll get the hang of it. Y'all forgive me, okay? Uh, so this could be a 6-volt or 12-volt coil. You want 1.5 ohms of resistance in your coil. So you're gonna have a one and a half ohm ballast resistor. So what you're gonna do is when you go into the start position, you're gonna be running full, full beams uh, into this coil and therefore full beams to your distributor, which is earth. Now, you know, your contact breaker points are nothing but a switch to, but that's, a, that's not what we're talking about now. So when you go into the starter, on a cold day, you're going to get all the fire you can possibly get into the contact breakers. Now, when you let off the starter and it springs back to run, you're going to go through a ballast resistor and you're going to up this to a total of three ohms and you're going to, you're, you're going to keep your coil cooler, your points are going to last longer, and all that other stuff. But just for that initial startup on a cold day or just in general, and you got to choke out a little bit or whatever, you, you want to have, I think it looks better like that. You want to have uh, all the power you can get to the contact breaker points, and then you want to uh, switch it back. And the switch is simply done with the key switch. And uh, so that's all there is to it. It's nothing real complicated. You, if you see three wires, that's probably what you have. If you see two wires, I would recommend that you make it like this. And you'll be happy. Your car will start a little better, uh, even in the summertime. Uh, and uh, your coil will run a little cooler, and you won't have so much resistance from heat from that. Now, you may have a four-wire system, and I, I don't ever do this because most of my stuff's cable drive, or I don't need it, or don't care. But uh, you know, your tachometer could be hooked up there too. So the the, the power from the key switch. And the power from the starter, from the key switch also, is generally, if it's negative earth, you're going to the positive side. And a lot, some old coils, and I have some, you'll see SW. And SW is generally your positive side, and that means switch. And then the other side will say, ready when you are, CB. Uh, so you'll see uh, Cecil B. DeMille there. The, uh, and that CB means contact breaker. And that's generally the negative side. And you measure your ohm resistance from going the positive to the negative, and you should get somewhere in the vicinity, depending on the temperature and depending on the resistance that's in the wires of your meter, uh, you might get 1.6, 1.7, which would be a little bit more normal because you got you can touch your wires together on your meter and, and figure out what to subtract. But this is how you do it, and it like I say, it doesn't matter what the make of the car is, doesn't matter if it came from Tierra del Fuego or Constantinople, wherever it came from, this is generally the system you run into on this type of old point system. Anything, if you got a John Deere uh, 4720 or 4420 or whatever, it doesn't matter. Now those are diesel, so you won't run into this on diesel. So let me see here, you gotta make sure that you're 1.5 and 1.5. If you get a three ohm coil and you put a resistor on it at 1.5, it's just it just not it it'd work, I guess. But I don't know, you know, if it if if it's advisable to do that. You probably would get some missing and stuff like that if you did that. And the other thing is, you know, you can measure from from where the coil wire comes out and goes to the distributor to uh, the positive and negative, and you see whatever your you know ten. 10 mega ohms or something like that. So, but anyway, when you run this system, you'll find your coil is cooler. Uh, everything uh, is just cooler and better, and uh, you don't end up with funky running problems later on. And uh, I'm telling you now, I'm going back to the point. And uh, the, 
I'm going to title this back to the points. And the, the point is that I'm, I'm just growing more and more afraid of electronic ignition. I don't drive enough to, to merit having electronic ignition. I have some systems. I have some aviation electronic systems. And I just, I just, they're all in a box. I'm, I'm not going to mess with that. Points are fine. Shop for the best points you can get. I hear Eklund makes good points. The, the condensers are junk now. So if you can get hold, if you go to a junkyard and get some old condensers, get them and measure them. Get a condens. I will do. We'll do that a little bit more in this thing. And uh, if you do it this way, the, the, that wiring way, you'll find it. The cold weather uh, starting will improve. Some 12 volt systems use six volt coils, just depends. If you get a reduction starter, uh, you, you'll find that the reduction starters are not uh, uh, slant, uh, what do they call it? Crash and burn, crash and bang uh, on the Bendix. And uh, there, there's actually a mechanism that drives the, the Bendix into the flywheel and then starts it turning that but if you whatever starter you got whatever starter you got to get just make sure that you can you, you can wire it up to the positive side of your coil or whatever side's required to make sure you get that extra hotness just for a second uh you can test all of this with a power off just by using continuity that is my preference uh, i will disconnect the battery and i will test on my wiring just on the continuity just because it's a switch, you're making contact. So you don't have to have the power on to do that and you and you cut down a lot of risk doing that. And I'll check some capacitors, like I said. And uh, now the other point too, and you'll see this all over the place and this is, this is gonna explain it easily for you. You get in your car, and I had this happen on a Corvette while I was getting gas one time. And uh, the, uh, you, you get in and it cranks and runs, and when you when you let go of the key, it turns off. Well, that generally means your ballast resistor has gone bad, and you can just jump across those and drive home. Don't go that way long. Just get yourself home because you're eating up you know your points and everything. So if you if you if you get that start doesn't run condition in the run position, then that's generally most of the time either your ballast resistor, your ballast resistor wire. And you know, check if, if you think you have a resistance wire, don't double up. Don't use a resistance wire and put it on a resistor, okay? So make sure that you, you ohm out all your wires going from your, your keyed ignition to your coil and make sure that you, you get you know, little to no resistance. And if you do, you got something in here. And GMs are famous for that, having a problem there. So uh, I don't... I don't ever, I don't think I've ever had anything with a resistor wire. So, but anyway, a lot of people do just make sure I would just plumb new wire. I just put from the age and corrosion and just make, you know, I, I pull new wire all the time. You, you saw my video uh, the other day of me rewiring a, a motor grader. I got to learn how to drive that crazy thing. So this is, this is my other notes to myself. So let's get down there and uh, see what's going on. I, I've watched so many videos that I, I, I know what's going on, but it hasn't really been explained very well in my opinion. And I just believe this is a better way to look at it. And if you look up stuff in your books on how it works, you don't, they don't explain to you. They, they show you how to wire it, which is all they have to do, but they don't explain to you why it works that way and that's what I really wanted to achieve here. I've been fretting over this. Oh, I had a good question today. Does the uh, Bonneville odometer work? And I was just checking that out. And I have a note here somewhere about that. Oh, where is it? There it is. Yeah, it said 37 on my video, so I've gone almost 20 miles. So the odometer does work. Uh, such is my life. I don't do anything with fiction. I just Everything for me is, is the hard facts. So let's talk about getting in trouble with Jaguar. <laughs> I 
I, I, I can't really explain this unless I show you this. So if you want to bust me and turn me into Jaguar, you can. But uh, one of the things about this manual is you've got to know what you're doing. You, you've got to before you, this, this will only help you if you know what you're doing in this book here. Oh, and to uh, my other friends like Mick and everybody else, you've got to have, whatever it is, your John Deere tractor, whatever it is, you've got to have this. This is uh, getting in more trouble here. This shows every little nut and bolt in, in, in a Jaguar, and hopefully, uh, there's the fancy uh, disc brake systems. A 1967 car with four-wheel disc seat. Every little piece is in this. So get your spare parts catalog for whatever it is you got, if you can get one. They're sweet if you can get them. There's an old clock over there. Uh, so what I'm going to show you is, uh, let me tell you. So when you assemble a motor, you need to put the drive dog in the... Uh, for the distributor on the camshaft. On some cars, you can pull those out and put them back. You know, you act like in the Bonneville, you just pull out and put it in. But on these cars, and I'll tell you where we are looking at this picture. This is the right front. That This is the water pump right here. So the drive dog at top dead center number six, which is the leading piston, the front piston, the drive dog should look like this. You can tell that it's offset. It's a British, old British car. MGs, Triumphs, they all have that kind of drive dog. A lot of those engines, uh, you can take it out and put it in as you wish, but be careful doing that because there's a very tiny Woodruff key. But this is what it should look like at top dead center, number six, front piston, and mine is, does not look like that. The engine's been out of my car, and uh, in order to change it on a Jaguar, you have to take the oil pan off and... You have to do all kinds of other stuff, and we ain't doing that. So you can get around this. You you can get around this. A distributor, let me get that razor blade out of there. You can get around that by just moving spark plug wires around and moving the distributor around and, you know, stuff like that. Just because some engineer said it goes that way doesn't mean you have to do it that way. Or if you end up in the position I am and you find that it's not that way, then uh, you... You just have to, you can take the sump off. I've already had it off and cleaned it, but I, I didn't really realize at the time that it was off. So this is a diagram of the motor. This is the back of the motor. You can tell by the camshaft wheels uh, covers are here. And this is the way the distributor should, should fire off. So number one is it like at the nine o'clock position. And these distributors, most of them go anti-clockwise. So it's one, five, three, six, two, four. So my, my firing for number six is going to be somewhere else. Actually, it's down around number five. It's, it's, it's off just a little bit, like uh, maybe two or three teeth. So you got to take this camshaft cover off, which I'll show you in a minute, and, and figure out where your camshaft is. And then once you do that, you can uh, find out where your intake comes around and where your uh, top dead center is not necessarily on number six, and then you can go down to your distributor and you can sort all that out. So let's go down there and see about that thing, okay? So this is uh, my, my library, some of it anyway. So today is Jaguar Day and Capacitor Day, and we're back to this, and I don't know if I'm gonna get to that today. Uh, I believe I've said all I want to say about that. But I, one thing I didn't say was about these. These, these are now junk. Uh, here, this one here was showing 0.23. See, it's relatively new. This was in the Jaguar. It is now completely dead. Uh, can you trust me on this thing? Uh, so there's your microfares. And uh, I had this thing set up to do the, uh, so, uh, let's see, let's make sure we're on that and touching that dead, completely dead. 
and it is there's nothing it, it's just it just ain't got the same heft see I've got this one I know the bands on it that that one really actually fits a Healy I think and uh, it's reading and I use my thumbnail as a notepad and uh, I got tons of the stuff I wish I had some more old capacitors uh, I'm just not just not getting it anymore it's just uh, aggravating it's just all get out and when was the last time you ever had a capacitor go bad so I think I talked about it but I had a 9 volt battery right clamped right here and I had uh, my drill and a rubber band and I was driving the the uh, distributor around to get the dwell on the points it really just does didn't work well with with the distributor out of the Jaguar so I ended up going uh, to just the feeler gauges and remember the longer they dwell the more spark you get but you know there's a give and take within thousandths of an inch on that so you got to be careful here's where I was clamping and doing and stuff so uh, I'm just gonna see how it does so just watch those capacitors fellas and I gotta order four of these I'm gonna replace all of these they're so old on let's see the TR4 the Healy uh, there's an old one on here I'm gonna change and I'm gonna put one on that and I'm gonna wire it up via the the get it hot cool it down system it's about time to do that electrical I mean uh, ignition systems can really really uh, suffer they uh, so and you don't want it suffering when you're 30 40 miles away so let's uh, let's take this up just a little bit not very much I Okay, so today we're going to change the oil. I was going to do a walkthrough on this thing, so let me do the walkthrough on this thing. Uh, I know the backlight's terrible. Uh, well, it's better than nothing. I can't, maybe if I stand this way, it won't be so bad. I tried to adjust the light level on this camera, but it's, I think I'll be happier with it the more I get used to it. Boy, spiders everywhere. So we're at the very back of the car. If you ever get one of these, the body number is behind the plate right here. You'll find there's a number here. And I know I wrapped it. You can't see all that anyway. Uh, you got to be careful with these because they're glass. Uh, that one was broken. Uh, I can get one, but I don't need it. Uh, so uh, that's the way it goes. I'm happy to have what I have. There's a great big backup light. There's an LED in there. I recommend that highly to see and be seen. Uh, okay, let me just walk through here. This is nothing but for wh where the spare tire bolts in. A lot of these cars, you will find this to be all rusted out. This is not the case here. It's very solid, and uh, so I'm very happy about that. This sticking down right here is the fuel pickup uh, reservoir, basically. It's the fuel cell, the, the pipe for pickup goes all the way down in here, and if you take this off, I have an extra seal standing by in case it disintegrates on you. But the pickup goes all the way to the bottom and there's a screen. So if you find your car's not running right, if you can't figure out what's wrong, this will be dirty. This, this gets all the dirt right here and it is designed to, to do that and catch it all. So you can clean. You need to probably make that a yearly thing or at least every two years or every you know, thousand miles or something. I mean, it, it, it can really, everything goes right there. And that screen is somewhat of a fine mesh. So this is the uh, cage type back end. Uh, I don't know if I'm gonna have enough light to overcome. Uh, there's some mess there. This unbolts, there's your brake system there. Uh, it, it, the disc brakes are internal. The emergency brakes are up there. And if you want to uh, change your uh, pads and all of that good stuff, you have to take all this out of here. You have to take the whole back end out. So you got to take your emergency cable off here, your hydraulics off, drop your, and it's designed to drop your exhaust system. Uh, and uh, you got to take off these arms here and the tray, I mean the uh, torsion bar. I've marked my bleeder uh, sizes, so I don't have to guess. And there's the other side, and uh, then there's eight bolts, and you can just drop this down on a transmission jack. It does not take as long as you may think. 
if there are some things that like if you want to change this bushing you you have to take this arm out because the other end of the bolt is there so that's okay give it a good chance to clean all that out and if you put these in you have to put them in uh, you know you can't have them you have to cock them the right way for the hole why they have holes I don't know uh, but you've got to kind of cock them that way so they will flex properly there is a, it's not extremely complicated you can see some of the wire there and uh, the wiring of the uh, aviation style bolts there's a bunch of it up high uh, and you, you can get a special tool to do that if you want to and make it look all pretty, but you can hardly see it even if you try. That one there looks like it's rub. Well, it's not rubbing. It's in like a millimeter away. So uh, these are the original shocks. I checked them when I had the back end out of it. Sadly, I didn't have a camera back then, and I, I would have loved to have uh, gone into this. But you can tell these bushings are new. These bushings are new, and these bushings are new. These exhaust bushings are new. Uh, the exhaust system is, is more or less new. If you take the back end out of it, or the motor, take the drive shaft out and rebuild it, unless you just did it like I did. You cannot get the drive shaft out with the motor and the rear end in it, so you might as well just you know do it if you got any questions at all. Get the highest quality uh, U joints you can. Uh, the pinion seal obviously isn't leaking. The story of the rear end is I was very disappointed. I took the hog head to a professional and he said it was fine. I didn't really believe him. There's a lot of bearings in here. Uh, there's your pinion bearings and there's two bearings on each side on, on the axles and two of them were just gravel. I, I just decided to change them irregardless of what he said and uh, you wouldn't have really noticed it uh, unless you took them out and when you put your three fingers in them and rotated them you could tell they were gravel and uh, you don't want any of that and if you got the rear end out and I, I got Timkins I drove a long way to get Timkins and uh, it's just if you get this thing out of here there's no time to be cheap it's time to do the right thing and there's new needle bearings in these and all that other stuff. So there's new rubber up there for bumps. And I know it's kind of a weird color, the green and red, but it's okay with me. So that covers the rear end uh, tutorial on this. Uh, there are bushings in here you want to consider changing. Uh, I wouldn't do anything other than stock because stock on these is better than, than racing on a lot of other things. So, uh, got these wrapped a little bit uh, just because I had wrapped and uh, this car does not have air conditioning, of course. 1967 will not have air conditioning as a rule. So this is the original speedometer cable. We're up to here now. And see how hard it is to get to all that stuff? And there's your rear transmission mount, uh, if you can. Uh, like I did, put all new rubber in there. You can see how clean and nice that is. Uh, this cable was compromised. <laughs> That's the word of the day here lately. And it goes up to that angle drive, and uh, so I had to wrap this one. But this one doesn't seem to leak like the uh, Spitfire one did, but that's a Mustang gearbox, of course. Here is the window where you can see top dead center. It's, it, top dead center's right here, but I have the, the, uh, the, the, the wheel uh, at 10 degrees because I'm getting ready to set the timing the rough static timing in it so you can check uh, top dead center here you need to go up to the engine it's one two three four five six on the spark plugs top dead center number six it's a front and that's where you check the thing I, I showed you a little bit earlier and that's the way that works uh, these cars did not come with overdrive. You don't need them. They went 150, a little less than that actually, uh, from the factory. So uh, there's your uh, new, I had this blew out on me at one point. There's your slave cylinder for your clutch. These are the, if I lost it, no, okay. Eh, I guess I have, but that's okay. You can see it well enough. This is the torsion bar, and they make these, we make them adjustable. I know that's Ford red. I don't care. 
And uh, here's the end of the torsion bar, and it goes all the way up here to the front suspension. There are procedures on how to set those. You, you measure it down and go up and all that stuff. And then here's the front brakes, and you can see all the wiring in of the aviation bolts. When you change, if you get a leaky uh, caliper, you just change these if you can still get them. Those are new. And uh, there's one on the other side. This is not slide across. It has two, and it pinches this way, and that's a crossover pipe. When you want to uh, replace your ball joints, you won't be doing that. You get a kit. Upper and lower ball joints are rebuildable in place. Uh, these things here, these shields uh, are nice. If you see any kind of fabric on them, that is asbestos. Do not mess with that if you don't have to. Take them off uh, and, and go somewhere, get a respirator, and clean them and do what you can. This is my EGR officially approved EPA vent for the block. And I don't care who likes it. So I've had the sump off and everything. And just uh, it's, I've had the bonnet off. The bonnet has the, you can see the great big plug right there, right, uh, right there. And you unplug it and you can take these bolts off. The wind just came up. Wonder if we're about to get a storm. And you can slide the bonnet off. It's not really horribly difficult to do. Uh, so anyway, you know, that's the way it goes. You can tell, uh, well, you can't really tell, but there's a, originally on, right there, and you can see the two wires, I put a resistor between them, uh, just kind of give me a reading. Uh, but uh, that's where the original cooling fan went, if you want to call it that, it's up at the house. It looks like a lawnmower blade off a child's lawnmower. It's ridiculously small. There's a spell, a huge fan up there, uh, manually controlled. I'm, I'm all done with that. I took the, uh, the rack out of it, the steering rack, right here. You can tell the boots are new. Everything in there is new. And I got a new U-joint in, in this going up to the spear that goes into your chest if you have a front end collision. So I did all that, so you need, you need to just take your time when you do this. The amazing thing is, you know, you drop the motor out. I dropped it out on my motorcycle lift over there. The engine and transmission rebuilt the whole thing. There's the 200 little needle bearings in here, 272 or whatever it is. And uh, so anyway, that's the way that works. Uh, there... Uh, we're going to drop her down in a while. I just kind of want to cover everything down here. So when you want to change the oil, you, uh, you can. It's okay with me. I'm getting ready to. This is a mess. This is a messy process. And you can see I had some dye in the oil that she's, she's going to leak out there a little bit. I don't think I'm going to change the color on that. This is a vacuum chamber for the brakes. Uh, it has a, a power assist vacuum brakes. So you got to pull this, you don't got to, but it, you, if you don't, you'll just get oil all in this pan. So go ahead and pull this pan down if, if you can. And uh, it's not a terrible task. It's an original little fitting there. And uh, then, the, then you can get to the oil change a little easier. So uh, that is sort of your E-type walk around underneath the, the little girl, uh, they are generally, suff they suffer over here because the battery's right up there. There was some damage here and I fixed it. And such as, such as it is, I mean, how good does it have to look? You know, it's underneath the car. So here's your rear brake line. Uh, the, uh, I'll show you from upstairs, but the hydraulically controlled uh, part, I mean, uh, uh, brake pad, brake lights are, there's a little, one thing down in there it's real hard to get to so if you got the motor out change that too because it's coming your way last thing you want is a bad brake line that that looks like hell and that's 9 16 this is an original jaguar part although somehow it got popped i don't really know how uh, but it did this is a drain for the overflow tubes on the carburetors and uh, there's the underside. Now there is your reduction gear starter. I'm gonna need to find a hot wire off that. This is not the crash and bang kind. This is the 
the Bendix must be engaged into the flywheel before the Bendix spins. Very beautiful design and uh, saves and keeps you from trying to find a flywheel. Good luck uh, for this thing, unless you get a racing one in there. They kind of tend to cause you to over rev. So you, you, you know, you just, if you, get, if you get stuck and have to get a racing flywheel, that's just, you know, you'll get through it. New rubber hoses there. Uh, I believe these to be the original 72 spoke wire wheels. I do know that they are the original knockoffs and uh, very beautiful. Uh, one of these days when I get tires, I'm gonna clean all this up and acid soak them, get them real clean. I'm gonna powder coat them because powder coating looks better than chrome. Uh, these on the TR4 are powder coated and they, they look better to me and they're easier to clean and they don't rust. Uh, so and once you just clean them off, they just look better. And they got powder coating that looks so good now. Uh, We'll drop her down. Series one has this is this must be one of the very last series ones. It was originally that blue that right there. It's called well, let's look under here. It's called Cotswold Blue. They didn't use this on many later cars. It was used on a lot of earlier cars, uh, 120s and 150s. You'll see a lot of Cotswold Blue. And if you're wondering what that means, it's the it's the what the Cotswold Mountains look like in the morning and they're in England, it's very beautiful. So if you ever hear the word Cotswold is where it came from. It's a mountain range. So uh, I've got a lot of the original tie downs here. So not original horns, sadly. Uh, all of that stuff's been pulled off. I mean, I did the whole motor. Some pesky oil leak right there, but that's okay. Check your belt, look around. And, uh, all right, let's, uh, you can tell the distributor. Now, so you can see with that distributor drive gear, what ends up right about here. New motor mounts are here, uh, and they're very, very simple. Everything, oh, a little bit of an oil leak right there. That's probably from the valve covers. The valve covers have extremely thin gaskets, and so they, uh, they they tend to leak. I'm not going to use those anymore. The uh, the one thing about this, I'm not going to do it. Maybe I should. But that car's been sitting there for about three or four days, and I moved it yesterday. And there is not one drop of oil leaking out of this 1970 British sports car. Believe it or not, not one drop. I got down on my hands and knees and looked for a drop. But putting the uh, remote oil filter and uh, rebuilding it and uh, it was leaking oil out of the head but there this thing is completely devoid of any uh, oil leaks i've never seen it in my whole life uh, i think ed china did that mga and they did, they were able to do that because i don't have a production company fixing me up there's the uh, su pump i prefer those if you got a mechanical pump on anything at all old car wise get rid of it Get you a high quality electric pump because you won't burn your starter up trying to crank it up, trying to get gas going up to it. Uh, Daphne over there with the Chevy 305 is electric. The Healy comes with electric. The TR4 comes with mechanical. I changed it to SU. It's behind the left rear wheel, just like in an MGB. Uh, uh, she has an electric pump now. She was a mechanical pump. This car originally had a mechanical pump and they are they were junk they were made by ac I, I hated them i had them on mg midgets and stuff i couldn't stand them but she has a su pump on it now so let's get this pan off i think i've you know just trying to walk through for people that uh you know just are just are kind of wondering about them there's there's a lot of walkthroughs and they're just not very complete the <coughs> excuse me the other thing to notice about the grill on a Jaguar E-Type is that there's really no grill. Uh, the it goes directly in. There there's no nothing to catch bugs. Radiator's way back up in there, but there's really no screen. Is what I'm trying to say. It just goes bloom right into the radiator, and you got a seal around the radiator too. And uh, this is my homemade version of the upper seal. And uh, I need to kind of trim that down and make it a little bit better. 
but uh, the, you've got to do your very best to channel all the air that you can. I lost that video. It doesn't matter what car it is, you need to do it. Uh, this car here, I removed the original, uh, uh, I, I guess, uh, channels, I don't know, whatever you want to call them, panels, panel channels, and to direct the air into this, and I put some seal up here to help keep this cool. I hardly ever run the fan. This has no mechanical fan. This car has no mechanical fan. That car has no mechanical fan. The Bonneville and the Healy do, and so, so does Daphne. She's got an electric fan. This has an electric fan. I'm big on electric fans, but I had to custom design this to get the air to actually go through the radiator. And if you've got one of these Spitfires, make sure you don't have one of those truncated, uh, only two-thirds as big as this radiator. Spit Bits has the full radiator, and it really helps. So a uh, little motor, but still. Uh, that's the way that works. So there's sort of a walkthrough of the stuff and uh, Let's uh, I Don't think there's anything else too much externally the originals the not the originals the first couple of years They didn't have this push down. They had flat panels. They're very uncomfortable to drive and they had DeSeuss fastener latches on the bonnet and these are internal latches, and we'll get all that when we get her down Let's get the oil up going out of her. I probably will just get it draining and then I'll come back to her tomorrow. I may come down. I may bring her down. I don't know. And uh, work on getting the uh, wires correctly, the spark plug wires in correctly. Well, that was long, wasn't it? As always, it takes longer to get things going. That thing there was full, so I had to put it into my trough. So I got all the fittings out of here. There's some here. There's one right there. Oh, there's one right there. Okay, hang on a second. I don't do this every day. All right, well, I think she's going to just fall out if I... <laughs> well, uh, I don't want that because I'm going to use you to hold it up. You give me a hand here. Yeah, there's oil in there. I don't want that dripping on my cam bot here. Uh, let's see how bad it is. See, now that can hit the old ultrasonic. There's not, not that much oil in there. What was I thinking? Well, you can tell. Yeah, the ultrasonic's hot anyway. So let's uh, put it in there and keep your fittings in order. That one's a little different than that one. I, this stuff's so, been done so many times, but now you can see why it's a lot easier to get to... Uh, your oil filter this way. Now, these straps that you see, yeah, I had a rattle there, I remember that now, uh, have to be in a particular place to hold all these inner panels. I found one of these, I got four of them, and, I, and uh, these inner panels must be held in properly. And uh, I guess that's the bottom of a overflow too. So hopefully I can get this not to have that big, oh, that looks like that's coming from up high. Yeah, it is. It's coming from the bottom of one of the carburetors. So, okay, I, mean, I did a good job on that last time. My suggestion is don't mess with this too much. Uh, you could just end up in a world of trouble. I actually have another one, but it's for a later model that I had to run for a while while I rebuilt this one. There's the oil pressure sending unit that that thing right right there, that that pot that you see on top of everything. And it looks like I did a pretty good job of getting it not to not to leak. So uh okay. So yeah, you when if you take one of these apart, you need to take very, very careful pictures and get all this stuff aligned properly. Now I have bolts holding some of this in with NIN nuts. Uh and uh, that's just the way to do it. You don't want to lose any of these panels or any of this stuff because you may never find it again. So there's a big picture of that. And you got to check this tank now and then to make sure that it's not leaking vacuum because vacuum leaks, of course, migrate their way back into the intake manifold and you end up in an unhappy valley and you don't want that. So, oh, there's a fuel line. 
and there's the big linkage up there for the carburetors. Boy, that's a that is a story in and of itself too, with all those special ball fittings and everything. So, all right, just you'll if you get one of these, you'll run into that, and hopefully you'll love every second of it like I do. So here are the the spark plug wires when I'm ready. And oh yeah, I get to put my air cleaner on. Boy, I hadn't looked, even thought about the, air, the big can air cleaner in a while. All right, we are ready to pull these two things out and this too. I want to take that out. I don't know if I want to or not, but I kind of want to replace this line. This is 7 8 and I use a line wrench on that. And uh, this is 5 8 up here at the end of the uh, rainbow. Uh, let me show you. You know what I'm talking about, but I just feel like you ought to see it. The end of the oil filter is 5 8 uh, and uh, you know, those will be 7 16 or what? Oh, sheesh. I like those things, but they get me sometimes. All right, I'm real curious to see what this oil looks like because I have, uh, I haven't changed it. Uh, get your pan way out there. Keep your eye on it and uh, don't end up with stuff all over the floor. So I just like wearing a glove doing this. I don't like chemicals on my hands. I see guys get brake fluid all over their hands. Probably should have something over my eyes too, but I don't. And if you drop a copper thing down in your catch, guess what? You can't use a magnet to get it out. Okay, let's see what the oil looks like. Here she comes. Oh, she don't look too bad. Look at that. She's actually kind of clear. Yeah, she smells good too. So let's just put this here. And I got an oily cloth here that's going to go out in the yard. All right. Well, that feels pretty good. See, it's pretty clean. See, it's, uh, that's really good. If you've ever been into one of these oil pans, because it's a race car, there's a big egg crate kind of device in there. And uh, to keep the bath, the oil from sloshing around and uh, keep the oil pickup from getting any air in it. So it, what I'm trying to tell you is there's every opportunity for a whole lot of dirt. So I'll put this uh, plug back in it and I'll pull the oil filter in just a second and it's going to make a bloody mess. It generally does. Okay, so if you're just going to plug it temporary like don't put your gasket back in there because you, you just don't want to run the risk of dropping it. She'll take a while. <laughs> she holds a lot of oil. I forget how much offhand. Uh, seven or eight quarts, I can't remember. But, but you better look it up. But she does hold a lot. As you can tell, God, it smells good. She doesn't smell like a, a nice restaurant, but it smells good to me. Aside from watching guys spray brake clean and everything all over their hands, up to you. I don't use a gear wrench to break things loose. Uh, I don't think that's good for them. And I've already given this a little bit of a turn. Let's see, i tell you what. Imagine me with lighting. I'm trying to be good here, I'm trying to be good. Oh, that's pretty cool. So yeah, you can see right there. And that's uh, 5 eighths. And it'll come out over here to these canister things. Now you can, if you want to, uh, convert these things. Don't do that. Don't do that, okay? Yeah, that's loose enough, okay? I was gonna just be ready for it. To... And this thing has an incredible number of threads. They're very fine. This, this, this bolt goes all the way through the filter is very long. I'll show it to you later. But she'll start, she'll crack and start le leaking here any moment. There you go. Now, you can drain this right here. Uh, I don't think I would worry with that. So, let's see if we've got uh, 
she will hold some residual oil and sometimes you can just spin the whole thing and it'll come loose yeah you can tell the whole thing's coming loose. I can't believe there's no oil coming out of there yet this camera's too fancy for me is what it is so there's the filter that I use in it now you can get those old there you go those liquid gold or gold something gold film gold flake gold bond whatever it is you got felt filters and that's really nice but I just don't uh, there it comes I just don't trust those very much and now especially in a filter with the orientation of horizontal if they're if they're vertical or somewhat vertical I'm kind of okay with that but this filter uh, those kind of filters will catch debris better than this one will and you can tell the oil is not terrible oh, another YouTube spectacular in anticipation isn't it uh, okay and you just got to make sure that thing keeps spinning now the internals of these filters is kind of interesting they have spring-loaded slip rings and this and that they have all kinds of different setups I'll look it up in the book tonight since I'm probably already in Dutch with Jaguar they probably uh, don't care at this point but see I use these uh, paper filters good quality ones and uh, I'll pull that out in a minute so And you can tell that bolt goes almost all the way through. See that fancy clip down there? You gotta, you gotta know about all that stuff. You're in, you're in Dutch with the wife there. So I, I do have, it's right here. I do have another end. If I should ever need it, uh, I hope that I won't. Thought I had one anyway. It ought to be over here. That ain't it. Well, I must have put it up in the Jaguar box, but I do have... Did I put it up here? It really doesn't matter. For, oh, uh, here it is, right here. This is a, a later model that will fit this block. So if you end up in trouble, uh, you can do this thing. And I got some aviation fittings. And I actually was running this oil cooler on it down here for a long time. And then I got lucky and was able to fix my old thing. But see, it says Leland right there on it. This, this, I would imagine, would fit everything from the late 40s up until the end of this block, but I don't know that for sure. But you can tell by that configuration that, you know, it'll go in there. And uh, so that's a, that'll take a spin on of, you can look it up, you know, 1980-something Jaguar, you know, six-cylinder. It's, it's the same thing. But uh, in here you will find, after I wash my hands, that uh, you'll find all the O-rings you need and everything. Make double sure that you get the O-ring out of here. Uh, I don't like to reuse them. Uh, you can. Let's see, I don't know if that O-ring is in there. So let me get, oh, where's my, there's my oily one there. Okay, guys, hang on a second. Let's get a pick. Let's see. is incredibly sweaty all right so let's just take a look there and see it looks like there's something there but you I have taken these off before and there will be several of these o-rings in there on this car and on other cars you can get away with it sometimes but that ain't no way to live brother yeah it's there I can feel it let's just spin it around Trying not to, uh, I don't know what to do about it. Okay, will you lie? If I get it out, I'll tell you about it later. But uh, I, a lot of guys will just, there it comes, see there. Oh, you saw it there for a second. It reared its ugly head. It was like that guy on, uh, ooh, she just, she's just, uh, all right. <laughs> 
There it is right there. Okay, so there's your O-ring up in there. And uh, just keep it for comparison. This is the oily side of the lift over here. So just put your pick back. You're not going to need it again. So the, usually these will come with several O-rings. Do not open this under the car at the risk of dirt being in. Let's go over here. And uh, I just like these so much better. I like, I actually like this kind. Ooh, there it is. Sometimes. And you'll find several of them. And sometimes they both, one of them will fit. Sometimes neither one of them will fit. So we're going to worry about that tomorrow because I think I'm about to shut down. I've had about enough of just sweating to death down here. So we will continue tomorrow, but that means, of course, that we see, this has been sitting about 15 minutes. And let's see how much oil comes. I'm big on this. I've done multiple videos on let it drain overnight if you can. And let's just see how much oil is out there. It was pretty well dry. Oh, and this is how much, see, look at that. That's just, that's just something, Ooh. Now see, it happens to everybody. I'm gonna get this stuff, I've already got my ultrasonic stuff hot. So, uh, yep, see it just keeps coming. All right, well let's get this stuff in the ultrasonic and uh, clean it up and, uh, ooh, I don't wanna knock all that stuff down in there. Okay, well, well let's, let's start this tomorrow. Okay, thanks a lot. We'll just continue tomorrow, bye-bye. Well, before we start tomorrow, I want to show you what I just found and before I forget. So here's your can. There's a rubber tip on it. And in there's a little bit of dirt. There's the long bolt with a very fine thread. There's a spring. There's a washer. Then there's a felt washer. And then there's this cup that goes on a particular way. Look at the dirt that's on that cup. So... And this motor's really been cleaned, so I'm happy to find it. I'd rather find it here. And then here is the little, the little clip. The, 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 boy, it's just, I just don't know when this thing's focusing. Seems to do a pretty good job. Oh, there's some little, there's some little things on the screen. If you put it there, it'll focus. See? Ah, okay, I didn't know that. So, okay, well, this thing here. I'll show you how to put it together tomorrow, but for now, there's a pretty good ridge of dirt right there. So that's what we're all about. So there's no sense in messing with this until tomorrow. Uh, guess I could pull that and see if I can get some oil out of there too. That might be the thing to do. This looks like 7 sixteenths. I mean, don't worry about it. I'm going to pull that hose. I gotta pull that off anyway. So all right, well let's uh. Let's definitely call it quits this time. There ain't nothing else I'm going to take apart.